I was made aware of a video that Shabir Ali put up on May 19th uh, by Colin Knight from uh, Islam Critiqued. He put a great video up there looking at the admission by Sh Dr. Shabir Ali that there were variants, uh, that there are many variants, and that that didn't matter because these variants didn't change any belief or any practice. I thought it was fascinating. It was just put up a few days ago. So I went back to look at this video, and as I was watching roughly 13, 14 minutes, uh, where he goes through and tries to help the Muslims understand that this is not a real problem, this is not a real problem, I started taking notes. And as I was taking notes, I said, wow, this is quite, this is exciting. See, I know Dr. Shabir Ali. I've debated him six times in person. We've debated in different formal debates all the way since 1998 we've debated. Our last debate was in 2014. So we're talking six years ago. And almost six years coming up in September. It would be six years. And at that time, I confronted him on the six major manuscripts. And it was the first time I think that he ever really knew that these manuscripts had problems. Uh, he didn't know how to deal with it at that time. And at that time, he was very clear uh, that he didn't really care about the manuscripts, that as far as he was concerned, uh, they, he knew that the Quran was the word of God had been preserved because of the number 19. 19, 19 here, 19 verses here. If you look at these set of verses and these set of verses, you get 19. These words and these words, you get 19, 19, 19, 19, all the way through proving that this was the miracle of, of, of Muhammad. And I was saying, you know, it was fascinating because when I looked at the manuscripts that I had just introduced to him, I couldn't find any versification. There was no versification. In fact, most of the manuscripts, in fact, all of the manuscripts were only incomplete. None of them were complete. Not one of those manuscripts of the six that I introduced. So I turned to him and I said to Dr. Shabbat, could you tell me what verses you're talking about and how is it you even know what versification is when there's not today any standardization of versification in any manuscripts that we look at today. <laughs> For those of us who are quoting different surahs and ayahs, we have to go five verses above and five verses below to find what you're talking about. And so finally he had to admit, well, it's the 1924. Egyptian, what we know as the Huff's text, and he mentions it in this video. That 1924 Huff's text is the one that we find. And he tries to explain why is it that that was chosen in 1924. What he didn't explain is that was only chosen for one city, uh, the city of, of, of Cairo in Egypt. And it was only for the Department of Education because all of the answers coming from these high school students' tests, standardized tests, were, had so many different answers that they had to make one Quran. Uh, that the unified Quran just for Egypt it became uh, standard for all of Egypt then in 1936 known as the Farouk edition and it wasn't only it was only standardized for all of the world in 1985 25 years ago now he didn't mention all this in his little video but nonetheless let's get back to what he was saying uh, today, most Muslims read the Quran in a text uh, that uh, is referred to as the Egyptian edition uh, of 1924. Uh, but this is not the only text of the Quran that is read uh, throughout the world. Uh, in North Africa, there is a slightly different text uh, that is uh, based on a slightly different reading, uh, mostly corresponding to what we read in the rest of the world, uh, but with some slight variations that do not affect anything that Muslims believe uh, and do not have any major impact on uh, any Muslim practices. Uh, and then, too, uh, in some parts of Africa, uh, there uh, is another reading of the Quran and a matching manuscript that is uh, prevalent. And here, too, we find some slight variations uh, that do not affect uh, Muslim beliefs uh, and, and do not ex affect Muslim practices in any significant uh, degree. So he was talking about the differences or the fact that there were differences. So that's quite an admission. And Colin brought this up in his video. And uh, Colin was saying, isn't this the same thing that we used to say about the fact uh, the, the roughly 40 verses there in the Bible? Uh, when you point them out, there's no theological difference. There's no doctrinal differences between them. Uh, and he was trying to take that same line. And that's what Colin so uh, brilliantly brought out and put forth. But I was fascinated by that, that there are no differences. I'd like to see if that is the case, because I remember when Hattun and I introduced this back in 2016 at Speaker's Corner, and we lifted up and held up those 26 different uh, Qurans, Arabic Qurans, there at Speaker's Corner, and the reaction we got from everybody, and one of the comebacks was always, 
these are no different. They all say the same thing. Whether When you look at the Hafs or you look at the Warsh, that's the one that, that Shabirani was referring to. That's the one in North Africa. That's the Warsh that's very popular there. When you look at them, there's no difference whatsoever. None whatsoever. And so he's saying that again in this video. No difference between them. No belief. He must have said it about five or six times. It doesn't bring any difference between belief and practice. Let's see if that's the case. Let's just see if that's the case. So let's look at the beliefs and practices. Uh, or let's just look and see if these make a difference, if there's any theological differences. I'm just going to look about six of them. Because after they, we put these up on the on, uh, at Speaker's Corner, we then the very next day did a studio copy, and we went through about 70 uh, examples of not thousands. We have we have really, if you want to look at all... Now, I think Hatun has about 37 that she has collected, 37 different Arabic Qurans. At that time, we only had 26. But in the 30... Uh, amongst about 23 of them that she's looked at, her team has already found 93,000 differences. 93,000 differences between just 23 of these different Qurans that Shabirari is saying, well, they don't give us any beliefs, differences, there's no changes of beliefs, there's no changes of practice. He kept on repeating this, as is to allay the fears of those who say, wait a minute, we were told that they were all the same, that there's only one Quran, and there's always been only one Quran. I'll be getting back to that, because there's some other things he brought that are just brilliant. But let's talk about this section, and that is, what do we know about the difference? So let me put these up, and I'll put them up before you, because these are the same slides that we did way back in 2016. They haven't changed. They're exactly the same slides. And I want to just go through with you these slides, and you decide whether or not there's any differences between the different versions, the different Arabic Qurans. And remember, what Muslims claim is that this book was preserved in heaven, chapter 85, verse 22 of the Quran says that as well. So it's not just the Muslims saying this, it's very much what uh, the Quran itself says. And if this is the case, it cannot have any human interference. Because if it has any human interference, then it is open to criticism. That means we can critically ana analyze it, not only textually, as Colin was saying, but we can also analyze it, uh, assuming, therefore, that if it's had any, even one uh, word or letter or verse change, uh, then it's open to all kinds of words, letters changed. And uh, we're talking about 93,000 differences. Now, he'll explain that later on in the video, but let me before we get to that, let's just look at these variants that we're going to put up. And the first one I'm going to put up is Surah 1-4, because that's the one Muslims always point to. That's the one they always want to go to. That's the one they, that's their default one. To say, see, this is nothing. This is really nothing. Here it is. Take a look at this. Surah 1-4. Surah 1-4 has the word Maliki in the Hafs. There you see on the left, the Hafs is Maliki with the Dagger Aleph. I circled it in red there. You can see the, the stick, the, the Aleph that's sticking straight up. The only owner uh, Maliki Yaumi Aldini is what it says, the transliteration. Now, the translation for that is the only owner of the day of recompense. That's in the first chapter of the Quran. In the Warsh, the one that, that, that Shabir Ali is referring to, in North, that's popular in North Africa, it's Maliki, which is the king. It doesn't have the Dagar Aleph, it's just the Fatah. You can see it, I've circled it there. So in one case, it's the owner of the day, the other is the king of the day. That's not really that much important. In fact, you're not going to get too many people that are going to quibble on it. And that's why Muslims like to go to that one as their example, as their default. Because it says, see, this is you can be the owner of the day or the king. It doesn't matter. You're the same person. A king is the owner, or the, the only owner of the day. Or the king of the day is the same as the owner. Either way, you can go back and forth. So therefore, they can. I can see why they default onto that. How about this one here? Let's go to this one here. This is Surah 3, Ayah 146. And how many a prophet fought with whom were many worshippers of the Lord? That's Gadala. And you can see there, uh, there is the Daga Aleph again. On the Warsh side, when you get to the Warsh reference, it's the Daga, the Aleph is taken out, the Daga Aleph is taken out, and a Dhamma is inserted there above the Kaf. And there it becomes Kutila. So instead of Gatala, it's Kutila with a Kasra under the the, the, the team. So you have the translation in one side is how many prophets fought with whom were many worshippers of the Lord. In the water side, it then says, and how many prophets were killed 
with whom were many worshippers of the Lord. Now you might say, well, okay, they fought or they killed. Who? That's not really much importance. Well, did the prophet simply fight or were they killed? I'd like to know that because if I were a prophet, I would rather fight than be killed as the former survives. So there you can see it's not really a theological difference, but it has, makes a big difference as to whether or not they just fight or are killed. Let's go to the next one, uh, chapter 38, 45. Now I'm skipping a whole slew of them. We went through 70 of them. Hutton and I, you can go back in 2016 and see what we did. I just want to give you a few choice ones just to give you an example of what we're dealing with here. Now here's the difference. In the, this is chapter 38, verse 45. And in this case, we're looking at the Huffs, which is the standard one, the one that was chosen in 1924, and we're looking at Al-Bazi, which is another one uh, that of the 37 uh, that we now have in our possession. And in this case, the word is Ibadana, with a dagger aleph there after. Uh, you can see it there above the B. So the translation would be, and remember our slaves, plural. Did you notice that's plural there? With the Ibadana, Ibrahim, Isaac, and Yaqub, owners of of the, and it goes on about these three. In Al-Bazi, the Dagar Aleph is not there. It's just a fata. And what's fascinating, the Dagar Aleph about the beam is missing. So it's just Abdana. No Dagar Aleph. So it's singular. So it would be translated. And remember our slave, Ibrahim, Isaac, and Yaqub, owners. You can see a problem right away. Are there three listed slaves of Allah or just one? Either Al-Bazi doesn't know how to count. Or in this case, it's a grammatical mistake. And that's exactly what we're saying. This is a grammatical mistake. So that would cause a lot of problems because how can you have a grammatical mistake in one of God's seven ahruf? As he keeps on talking about seven ahruf. Now remember, we're up to 37 different ahruf. So this is no longer seven, but that's the seven ahruf that they have to get from the tradition. We'll get into that. That's a whole other video about the ahruf and the readings. Nonetheless, can you see he's at this time, already we're going to see that there are it, we, we do have a real difference between the, the two texts. Let's go to look at another one, and this is chapter 43, verse 19. And it's in the Hafs, it's, it's about Ibadu, slaves, translation, and they make the angels who are slaves of the beneficent females. So Ibadu, but in the Rao translation, or the Rao reading, it's Inda, so it's a completely different word. Can you see that? Look at the what's underlined in green, then look what's underlined in yellow. So here you have inda. Inda is a completely different word, and it means in the presence. So whereas in the Hafs it says, and they make the angels who are slaves of the, really that should be Allah, females. In the inda recitation it's, and they make the angels who are in the presence of Allah, females. Now there are two problems here. One is, are the angels slaves of Allah or simply in the presence of Allah? Or second problem, is it the slaves or those in the presence of Allah who are made females? Now, if I were an angel, I would prefer to be in God's presence rather than his slave. Furthermore, being male, if I were an angel, I would prefer uh, if the slaves were made females. Thank you, not, not myself. So you can see, regarding, regardless of whether you want to say this is not a theological problem, this is not so much a theological problem, well, some may say so, because who are in God's presence that are made females? Are they the slaves or just people who are in their presence? So you can see you've got to deal with which is which is the one, the standard that is in heaven, which is the one that is on those turn, eternal tablets. And it's fascinating that in every case, in this case, Huffs has got it correct because in the case of the number of people, well, whether or not uh, with the Ibadana, in, uh, with the, th the th three listed slaves of Allah, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Yaqub. There you can see that the Hafs has got it correct. So which suggests to be, in every case so far, Hafs has been correct. In this case, there is a difficulty between the two texts. Now let's go to chapter 46, verse 15. And here you see, Isana. Uh, so it says, and we have joined on man doing good to his parents. Doing good is how that is translated in the Hafs text. In the Alduri, which is fascinating, because Alduri has really two different uh, Qurans. He he does he actually contradicts himself later on. But in this case, this is the Abu Amir al Allah al -Ala, uh, version of his readings. It is Husnan instead of his Isanan. It's Husnan, which means beauty. So on the Huff side, and we have enjoined on man doing good to his parents in the Alduri translation, and we have enjoined on man beauty to his parents. So. 
but the problem here is, are men supposed to do good or be beautiful to their parents? Now, I'm a parent. I have three boys. And I would prefer that my boys were good rather than being beautiful. To me, that makes a big difference. So you can see that would make a huge difference. Uh, not so much theologically, but it's certainly in the application, it would make a big difference. Uh, let's go to, the, to another one. And this is probably one I'll end with. And that's Surah 98, verse 6. In the Huff's translation, it or a version, it has Bareyati. Bareyati is the word you can see underlined in green creatures. In the Warsh, which is the one that's used in North Africa, it's the Al-Asbahani version of the Warsh, because there's more than one. Uh, the word is Al-Bare'ati, Bare'ati, with the glottal stop there, <clears throat> in, underlined in Yah. You can see there, that's completely, it is a different word, especially at the end. So, <clears throat> that refers to as the innocent. So, the translation in the Hafs would be, indeed, they who disbelieved among the people of the scriptures and the polytheists will be in the fire of hell, abiding eternally therein. Those are the worst of creatures. So it's talking about us, really, Christians. In the Warsh, which is popular in North Africa, the translation would say, indeed, they who disbelieved among the people of the scriptures, that's us, and the polytheists, those are the heathens, will be in the fire of hell, abiding eternally therein. Those are the worst of the innocent. Well, now, there are two problems here. One is, are Christians the worst creatures, or are we innocent. And if we are innocent, what are we along with the Jews and the polytheists doing in hell? So that has a theological problem. You could do a doctoral thesis just on that, depending on how you're going to place that. Are we innocent or are we just the creatures in hell? And so you can see that has completely, that completely changes the theology, changes the meaning. So when Shabir Ali gets up there and he says, this doesn't change the belief, it doesn't change uh, the, uh, certainly the practice, he has to repeat that over and over again to placate the people who are watching him. I would suggest they be careful. Now, we're just looking. We've just looked at six or seven. We could look at 93,000 and look at the differences. I don't have time, nor do you have the time, nor would you want to. But this could be a huge work that we need to do because I'd like to know exactly how he has, how he knows that this doesn't change the meaning. Uh, if I've just come up with six of them here, which has changed the meaning in every case. And in some cases... Because of the fact that it changes the meaning, it goes against exactly what he is saying. I let you come up to your own conclusions, but for Shabbi Ali, somebody of his caliber, somebody of his station, and of course he's well known all over the Muslim world, he is highly respected, has a doctorate uh, from Toronto University, and the fact that he is considered to be probably the world's best debater in the Muslim world, in the English language, well, in any language, because really the debates are all happening in English today to have someone of his station say these things and not complete. And that's what's fascinating to me because he gave no examples support to support what he was saying. And that makes sense because if I can come up with six examples right now that change the meaning, in some cases change the theology, and in some cases would change the practice, it stands to reason then why he came up with no example to support his case. Well, we'll leave it for him. We'll leave it for others. We'll leave it for you to decide. Does this change the meaning? We're going to go on and, act and bring up some other things that he brought up in this video, but that's enough for now. I just wanted to deal with this whole problem of whether or not these variants, these diacritical variants, hold on to that. These are not consonantal variants. This is not the most damaging stuff yet. This is just the diacritical variants. Wait till we find, till, till we let you know and see what we're coming up with the consonantal, the rosum text, the skeletal text. Ooh, wait till you get to that one. Then you really do change, see a changing meaning. Okay, this is Jake. Over now.